in the recording. Ah, there we go. <laughs> All right. So queer. when we talk about queer, um, we're talking about uh, a lot of different things, and we're intentionally uh, queering it by not giving one set definition of what, what queer <laughs> <That's> is. So queer. <laughs> <laughs> Which is queer in and of itself. But we will we will continue to un, uh, unfold this idea and then like dive into queerness throughout our time together. That's right. So one of the questions that we have are oh, oh I went too far. Um, how can we? What does it mean to queer the text? So queer as an action word, as something that we're doing to the text or doing with the text. And so uh, we have some questions that we like to use when we're thinking about queering the text. So um, we're breaking them out of their bounds of uh, traditional understanding when we queer the text. We're looking at who is, um, who is gaining something from the interpretation that always has been that sort of thing. So here's some questions that we've kind of come up with uh, to help us all queer the text to look at the marginalized perspective and see um, in what ways is the marginalized community um, left out or uh, embraced in these texts. And so you can take a screenshot of these questions if these might help you as you're doing some exegetical work as you're thinking about worship as you're thinking about practice. You might not just think about ways of querying the text, but also querying religious practices in our settings when we decorate in a certain way. Um, who's included and who's not included? And uh, why are we making some of the choices that we're making? So um, some of the questions that we like to ask is who's represented? Who's represented in this text or in this interpretation of a text or in the way that we decorate the space this way or in these practices of taking something on or, um, or giving up something? Who's left out? Whose voice is excluded? Whose voice do we not hear from? I had a professor in seminary who always talked about uh, there's the black text, the black words on the page or the, the text, but there, there's always this white fire between all the spaces in the text. So, you know, who's being represented in the white fire? What questions what might we ask of the white fire? Um, where are the where are the other people whose names or stories aren't aren't represented in the black text, but whose stories and names are represented in the fire around it? What binary assumptions are presented in this text or in this way that we do things? What is another way? How is this text traditionally understood? What are some, what are people coming into this season or into interpreting a ter certain text with already, depending on what kind of tradition they're in? Many of our communities have people from all kinds of traditions, so it might be a good healthy exercise just to think about the many different traditions and how they use seasons or how we use texts differently. Who does this interpretation satisfy? So if we take one of those or a few of those, who's satisfied by that? And are we happy with that? Are those the people that should be satisfied? When we talk about querying, we're often talking about where is the power in the text? So if we're trying to give the power to people who don't often have power, then what would a queer interpretation help us to see where power could be or help us to give some new ideas for that? Who does the text comfort or the practice comfort? Same kind of question with that. Who does it make uncomfortable? I think Jesus is often making the people who are in power, the elite, uncomfortable, which is something that I love about Jesus. Probably the number one thing that makes me a Christian personally, even though I don't love the term Christian, I think it has a lot of baggage. I think a lot of you probably agree with that. Um, but Jesus is constantly making people uncomfortable. So if we're comfortable reading the text, what does that say about us? Maybe we need to go a little bit deeper. Who's missing from the conversation altogether? You know, this idea of like the 12 disciples being with Jesus, hanging out at the Last Supper. I always think of like a crowd of women and children and dogs and maybe even a couple of domesticated cats, you know, hanging out at the table too, eating the scraps. Like, I just feel like there's so many people who are left out of that conversation altogether. So who are the people that are left out, the situations that are left out, the relationships that are left out? So as I mentioned in my little intro, um, I like the practice of of taking something on in Lent 
and sometimes giving something up. Um, but uh, the intentionality of Lent allows for us to consider taking something on. As a pastor, that's one that I always encourage in my community that people um, think of of a practice, a spiritual practice, um, something that that feeds the soul that that one can can take on to journey with throughout the Lenten season. Um, and similarly with with giving something up, which is the more traditional uh, Lenten way of doing things. Um, what is something that that one can give up? And in those moments of of feeling uh, missing the thing that they've given up, you know, filling that space with God. Now, I will say, if you're if anyone who is serving in a community where there are people who are experiencing some kind of oppression, um, feeling um, in some way harmed politically or feeling, you know, people who live in poverty, people who are being denied basic civil rights, um, the the language of giving something up might not resonate. It's like, how much more do we need to give up? So empowering people to take something on, um, I think, can be a, a really soul-filling uh, experience. And I think a lot of people, especially in oppressed communities, um, lose the the knowledge that um, that we have the right to to choose things and take things on. And so it can be a very powerful thing to say, what are you taking on intentionally for your spirit in this season? And just to add to that, a lot of people uh, come from traditions where they're used to taking, giving up something like chocolate or something edible, and there can be a lot of shame that comes around that. So even when we're talking about some of these practices, even if we might say something in a flippant way, sometimes that really gets in people in a in a deeply sensitive place. And so thinking about like if we're if we are giving something up, um, what is the reason that we're giving that up? What is the transformation that we're trying to look for? It's not just about like um, you know, depriving ourselves of someone so we can show how holy we are, hopefully, right? Um, but but what are we making room for in giving something up? Or what are we trying to understand about someone else's experience more for giving something up? Um, I think of a few years ago, a few of my friends and I decided to give up single use plastic for Lent, which might sound kind of ridiculous, but we, like I am uh, constantly, you know, trying to fight against the consumerism in my own soul, like when scrolling on Facebook and seeing perfectly curated ads for things that I want to buy instantly on Amazon <laughs> covered in plastic. I, maybe you are not like, you know, fall into such creatures in the world, but I definitely am. And so uh, giving up single use plastic was probably the hardest thing I've ever done for a Lenten practice, but it has absolutely transformed the way that I see plastic and like, like try to buy cheese, like think about buying cheese. You know, I was like bringing my Tupperware to the deli counter saying, can you just give me a block of cheese, like all sorts of strange things like that. But but really, the Lenten practices are designed to transform us. So like Jacob said, giving people the opportunity to know their worth by taking something on that helps them to take up space in a world that says, like, you are not welcome here. You should not take up space. Like, what an empowering, transformational activity to invite people into. Or inviting people to, like, totally put down the patriarchy, the capitalistic ways that we are so trained to living in by only bartering for a season or something like that. Like, that is transformative in a way that is very challenging for me and maybe for you, too. So this, the, our next uh, thing is uh, what we enter into Lent with, of course, is Ash Wednesday. Um, Oh, our glitter ash has disappeared. Um, <laughs> oh, no, they just disappeared. <laughs> That's so funny. Uh, well, there you go. The Holy Spirit has spoken. We had a little graphic. With <laughs> no glitter ashes. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so a company called Parody and some other companies have come out with um, glitter ashes, which um, has has caused a stir in the, in the queer queer Christian circles. Um, so we uh, we also just put this silly graphic about the different ways of doing ashes on a person's forehead. Um, 
so let's consider for a second um, the meaning of Ash Wednesday. So when uh, with this idea of the glitter ashes, uh, I'm just going to make the assumption that people have seen this and, and, and know at least what it is. If not, uh, it's it's ashes that have glitter mixed in. And, and it's sort of a, a queering the idea of how we talk about death, how we talk about the reality that we will return to ash and um, and that by putting the glitter into it, there's a, a, a lightening of the mood and making it sparkly and re remembering um, not only that we will die, but that, that we are uh, gorgeous glittery people now and when we are no longer here. Um, traditional Ash Wednesday um, has has the similar concepts of remembering that we are going to there will be a time when we are no longer, and um, there is something very queer about acknowledging the inevitability of death and just sitting with it, whether we use glitter or not. Um, I, I think, you know, you look back on the AIDS years, um, the queer community, uh, queer communities have certainly taught other communities a lot about uh, what it means to em embrace living into our dying. Um, in the chat, somebody points out that um, hey, lots of glitter is not environmentally sustainable. We actually talked about this in our planning. <laughs> of this <laughs> workshop um, not to disparage the incredible people who who created the concept of glitter ashes but it is true as as sad as it is for for those of us who uh enjoy glittery things that glitter in general is not the best choice for the environment especially all those little microplastics um, Did so, you want to say anything else about that, Lauren? No, I think you did a great job. So just <laughs> something else to bring to your committees or to take space in your brain about uh, the design of the ashes. So we wanted to, if you haven't looked at the lectionary text yet, we thought we'd do a little bit of homework for you and give you what they are. Obviously, these don't have verses and everything. We just, we, uh, and we drastically summarize them like Genesis 9. The text is the rainbow. I'm sure you know what that means. <laughs> so <laughs> this is God putting the rainbow uh, into the sky after the flood. So um, hopefully these keywords are enough for you to kind of see what the main text is. But um, you can go ahead and look on a lectionary one too. So there's, we kind of were looking at these and saw there's, um, uh, if you stick with the Hebrew Bible, there's a lot of covenantal stories here. And so you might go that kind of route of thinking about, you know, what does it mean to be in covenant with one another? Um, uh, what does that really look like? What are we looking for in covenant with each other? Um, what does life in Jesus offer us in covenant that might be different from a different kind of life? What does it mean to really be rooted in love and to um, make all of our decisions through that lens of love? And then we thought, you know, Lent is such a time of ritual anyway. Way, that wouldn't it be fun to think of a way to have a symbol or a ritual even in um, most or some of the worship services that are, are inherently queer and so we have some sort of ideas for uh, this which we are certain that you could make even brighter and more queer um, together in community because the queerest thing that always happens in community is that things get even weirder and more fabulous and so um, so these are just some ideas to start with that we were kind of bouncing around with some of the resources um, that we have and we'll link to some of the resources at the end too but here we were thinking, you know, if you wanted to start off in a queer Lent and to really go in with the theme all the way, you could start with a rainbow. You could have a worship service that instead of centering around a homily or a message, maybe it has a little message or reflection that has each of the original colors in the uh, first gay pride flag. Um, and so you go through some of those and you kind of center yourself in that way. And then perhaps instead of encouraging people to pick up a certain practice or pick a certain thing to give up or to take on um, that they could pick a color that goes with what they're looking for for the season and they might have um, you know you might have a bunch of marbles of all the colors of the rainbow flag or um, you might have buttons or you might have 
ribbons or you might have something else of all the different colors that people could choose one or more of those colors that uh, they want to take on as a practice so thinking about um, what the colors mean and, and letting them kind of figure that out for themselves of how they might queer or how they might bring that into making their own lent a, a sort of grounded and queer experience if that makes sense for the second week of lent we uh we have a passage from uh, it's still in Genesis 17 now, and it's, uh, the theme is I will change your name. It's the story of Abram to Abraham. And this is a great one for queering because, um, it's a, it's a great opportunity to, to lift up the trans folks in the congregation and really anybody who's gone through any sort of name change. Um, I love the idea of doing a blessing of a person's name or a blessing of a person's gender or pronouns. They don't have to be newly out, but so many people who are trans in our congregations were baptized uh, pre-transition. So it is uh, a very affirming thing to have a, a reaffirmation of the baptism um, or if they need to be baptized or want to be baptized or some other kind of uh, holy anointing of, of, of a person's name. There's also the possibility of a litany of shouting out pronouns where everybody trans or not trans, um, claims their identity. If, if, if every single person in your congregation is, is a, is not a trans person, which is, you know, entirely possible. Um, cisgender folks, people who are not trans, um, often never had an opportunity to really claim their own genders because it's just been the gender that that they've lived with their whole lives. So it can be really empowering, even if someone has used the same pronouns their whole life to, to really claim it. So giving giving some uh, explanation of, of what it means to claim your identity and giving people an opportunity to just shout it out. And then the other thing is, um, uh, in the in the race to the bottom that we have uh, among many states right now in terms of how how trans people are being treated. Um, uh, Florida uh, is really um, doing its best. I live in Florida and I've got to say that there's new legislation, which I won't get into in great detail, but that basically uh, is um, making it, even people who uh, transitioned long ago uh, and have had their gender markers on their identification congruent with their gender identity, um, it will retroactively be changed back to the sex assigned at birth. And going forward, no one can have their uh, gender markers changed in Florida. Um, so another practice, which is getting on the political side, so you have to be a little careful, but uh, mobilizing people to write letters, letters to lawmakers or letters of support to trans folks in Florida, um, because it is a... a a terrifying time and other states uh, as well have have horrible uh things happening to the trans folks exactly it's, lent is such a good time to really lean into the awful awful ways that people are being treated in our country and across the world and so inviting people into political action each week or um, specific type specific parts of the Lenten season is a really good way to engage with that and to raise awareness and give people a funnel to be able to use their voice for good so we'll go a little bit quicker with some of these other ones because we have a couple more slides and we want to make sure that you all have some time too to say things. Um, but those were two of the, the biggest ideas that we had that you can kind of take into go in, in other directions. You know, the Lent, Lent 3 is on Exodus 20. So there, there could be an interesting thing about like, what's the difference between a covenant and a contract? And um, like, how does God meet us in forgiveness? And there could be some really interesting thing here. You could, you know, invite people to do a rule of life, to practice intentionality that way you could have another kind of letter writing campaign unfortunately there are so many places that could use support of encouragement and support um, to uh, take down some of the legislation that's going through across our country um, and then numbers 21 has the story of the serpent on the pole so it takes the thing that can kill you is is actually what can give you strength which is again another concept that's that's unique and and quite queer. 
even the word queer is that for many people. And some of you might have seen that in your lifetime of a, of a single word being used for harm and then now being, um, uh, you know, reclaimed and claimed as something else. So there could be lots of different ways that you could use that kind of example too. Jeremiah 31 is about marriage vows. So you could bless relationships. You could go way out and bless singleness. You know, oftentimes we we talk about gay marriage so much in churches. Or we talk about opening marriage to, you know, more than just two people. Um, but we don't often talk about the blessing of singleness and some people who choose to be single. Or um, I don't know about your communities, but our community has a lot more people who uh, describe themselves to be asexual. And we need to make room for those people. Other churches are not going to do that. So if you're an inclusive church, that also means making room for people who are ace or aromantic or um, all these other kinds of folks, too, that also need a space to be loved in. And so it could be a great time to lift up some of those communities, too. And uh, for the sixth week of Lent, which is uh, Palm Sunday, um, protest signs, making signs of, of protest, um, the the sacredness of the the pride parade, the sacredness of the ways that we stand up for our rights and also the rights uh, of others, solidarity, um, you know, part of LGBTQ work is solidarity with people um, across multiple boundaries and lines. And so you could have a, a, an exercise of the instead of the traditional Palm Sunday processional, um, creating protest signs and have a little protest march um, through the church, through the parking lot, uh, down to City Hall if you want, or uh, wherever. And Easter, what holiday could be more queer than Easter other than maybe Pentecost? Like Easter is absolutely inherently queer. Um, and so thinking of ways to retell the story, thinking of ways to um, call people out of their tombs, to make sure every, there's no remnant left in the tomb. You know, sometimes we're so excited about our own liberation, we can forget about the people that are left behind in the tomb. So, um, you know, how can we make a liberation for everyone and how, how does... Um, uh, Jesus's liberation out of a tomb, invite all of us to think about that. And then looking at the Gospels, this is just a one slider. Uh, these are the main stories in the Gospels for this season in the lectionary. So we start off with Mark 1, which many of our churches already looked at. I know, that's weird. I see some of your puzzled expressions. I was also puzzled. <laughs> uh, baptism in the Jordan, we just did that. But hey, we get to do it again. Maybe we can make it queer this time. Maybe it can be pink waters. I don't know. There's all kinds of things <laughs> that we could do for that. <laughs> um, so then the second week is from Mark 8. Get behind me, Satan. Lose your life. Or... Uh, Mark nine transfiguration. Um, I, I, well, I personally like these texts that are like so confrontational. Um, and also I, I, I enjoy, <laughs> although this isn't literally about Satan. I do enjoy the texts that talk about Satan and, and demons and things, because it gives us a chance to say like, let's look at this text in a different way than, than in, in ways that, that make us uncomfortable and, and see, see what we can learn in that. Absolutely. I love those texts too. It's fun to play with them too. This is like another perfect way of querying this tradition around Satan and who is Satan? What is Satan? Like what is sin? What does all this mean? It's a great time to to transform some of that. Um, Lent three, you know, driving out the money changers. What could be more queer than that? Say no to capitalism. You know, you could have people make little tiny tables and like flip their little tables whenever they get mad about something like, you know, holy, we should have holy anger over the things that are happening in our world. And we, we should drive out our whips, whatever those might look like. Um, and think about what it looks like to, to really drive out some of the evil that is in our lives and in our, in our community, in our culture. And then Lent 4 brings us back to the serpent on a stick. Um, and in John, in uh, the third chapter of John. Um, and also here's where we get, for God so loved the world. Uh, the, the, the one Bible verse that most people know. <laughs> <laughs> they know no other. Um, 
Did you know it's also on the bottom of Forever 21 bags? No, but it's also on the bottom of uh, uh, what is the fast food restaurant in California? In and out. In and out on their cups. (laughs) So there you go. Um, There you go. Clear that. It actually gives you a, a, a chance to talk about that, like the commercialization of this concept, and yet what it what it means as opposed to it being just a slogan. Mm -hmm. And then John 12, Jesus predicts his death. Uh, So uh, other ways to think about prophecy in the world, um, some invitations into that. And then we have Palm Sunday, which we already kind of talked about, and Easter too. And someone in the chat reminded us that Easter is also Trans Day of Visibility, which is super great. I love that it's the same day. How fun. So lots of really great ways to uh, lift up trans people in our world and in our communities. And if you're a community that has a lot of cisgender people, maybe this is a time for you to really lean into the prophetic wisdom that we need to hear from our trans folks in our communities and the ways that we need to uh, bolster their voices with ours, especially in this political season. There's also another uh, uh, an option for, you know, talking about alternative resurrection stories. So uh, claiming who we are, but coming out as as resurrection, not in a uh, heretical way, <laughs> not in a way that 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 takes the focus off of Jesus, but but in a way that 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 talks about affirming life. You know, we've gone through this the season of Lent at this point and Jesus comes out of the tomb how do how do we come into ourselves and again lifting up trans folks in your community maybe even um bringing in a trans person as a guest speaker who's a part of your community um to to tell their story of of what what resurrection can mean in in our lives today Mm. Uh, and, and then sometimes the queerest thing to do with the lectionary is to throw it out the window. Uh, someone else was kind of saying, you know, how do we queer the lectionary? How do we give ourselves permission to do that? If you're someone who's bound by the lectionary and feels really compelled to it, you might really challenge yourself to throw it out, to do something else, to uh, try on a new practice in this season. So one idea is that you could look at Holy Week as the whole season. So, you know, start with Lent 1 being like Monday of Holy Week where Jesus comes in and, um, you know, and uh, tosses over the tables and um, and really challenges the money changers in the temple. So you could start with that being like Monday and then do a slow, a slow sort of way of unpacking the entire Holy Week instead of just cramming it all into those few services that, um, you know, many people, at least if your churches are anything like the ones that I've been at, uh, we don't get great attendance in the middle of the week. So you have to do something to talk about Good Friday on Easter, something to talk about Good Friday on Palm Sunday. So uh, taking a real slow, methodical way through the whole week might be a way to invite people into the deeper part of that story and gain more appreciation too for really the queerness that, that is Holy Week in the way that we practice it too. Um, And then another idea we're borrowing from Sanctified Art, which is a great resource. If you haven't already found a Sanctified Art, they do really beautiful things, including art, as it says in the name. And um, they have poetry, they have visual art, they help you with um, like slides and backdrops and all that kind of stuff. So they have a a huge wealth of resources and um, good sermon ideas, that kind of thing. And this year they're focusing on Peter. So you could do what they're doing and focus on Peter, or you could focus on a different biblical character or a different set of biblical characters and um, focus on a totally different way through, through Lent. And Sanctified Art is not a sponsor of, <laughs> of this webinar, but I will say that I absolutely adore Sanctified Art and I use their resources a lot in my church and people have come to expect them, especially their uh, devotional guides that you can print that come with a little packet of, of things for each of the church for season. And we have some other worship planning resources that we want to lift up. Uh, Enfleshed is a fantastic resource. Uh, if if you are a person who is leading worship and writing sermons 
you have got to subscribe to Enfleshed. Again, none of these <laughs> none of these sponsor us, <laughs> but but I will totally uh, plug them because um, Enfleshed is very uh, very queer positive. Uh, a lot of queer folks write for them, and it is just uh, really the the place I always turn if I am feeling a little, uh, especially if I'm feeling a little stuck in what I am trying to, to create for any given Sunday. Um, we've already mentioned sanctified art. Oh, did you have something else you want to say? Well, I was just going to add to that. There's a lot of resources, like past resources too, that you can see in Enfleshed. And they've done a lot of really great queering of Psalms or queering of other scripture. And so, and in addition to some of the things that you might know them for, like prayers and that sort of thing. Um, but I just wanted to double that. Great resource. And like really queer, a sanctified art and worship design studio are really wonderful, inclusive resources, but not necessarily queer, I would say. Mm -hmm. And um, and there's another one that we actually didn't in include on there that I'll throw out now, which is also very progressive, but not queer. Uh, it's called the Pulpit Fiction Podcast. And uh, I highly recommend listening to that. They talk about the lectionary texts each week they do an hour-long podcast and uh it's often my my starting point in my sermon writing and i miss it whenever i go off lectionary which you know what i'll be honest when i was newly a, a pastor like eight nine years ago i was like i'm just gonna do a worship series i'm not gonna do a lectionary and then i realized this wealth of <laughs> resources <laughs> and i became less less queering in my work um and more <laughs> What can I dig into? I'm looking at uh, Ms. Ann's comment. Uh, she says, I would also add Cole Arthur Riley's Black Liturgies to that list. Oh, excellent. Yeah, uh, and her, her other book, This Here Flesh, is also really great. Oh, that is really good. Yeah, that's the same author. Yeah, 10 out of 10. Yeah. We're not sponsored well, by any of these people. None of these people probably know we exist, actually. So, you know. But fine. we will... <laughs> Actually, let's add those because we're going to do, be doing some more of these kinds of uh, conversations. So, and if you have any any other resources that you find are amazing that you want to add, um, drop them in the chat. All right, so we have about a little bit more than fifteen minutes left, and now is a chance to. Uh, discuss and and share ideas and you know what what are you thinking about for Lent? What questions do you have? Did anything spark in you um, that that you would like to uh, discuss? This is the quietest group we've ever had for one of these kinds of things. <laughs> uh, oh, Colleen put in the chat. So there's a lectionary group uh, that uh, Jacob Jacob goes to every week. I'm like not so great attending, honestly, but I'm going to for this season. I am committing here in front of everyone. Uh, Jim Matelski is in that group. Colleen Dare is in the group. We have a great group of people. So if you are someone who preaches from the lectionary and want a group of queer people to talk to, um, we mostly talk about the lectionary and also catch up with each other. So know that. And we meet on Wednesdays at 10 central time, mm -hmm. which is other so times in other time zones. It is eight Pacific, 11 Eastern. Um, and um i'm trying to you could it's a it is yeah it, so it it is uh yes thank you in, in nine mountain time i knew I, I left something out um it's a queer group but it's open to anyone you don't have you're it's, you're not required to be queer to uh to join us i just put a my email in the chat and you can email me or you can email Jacob, if he feels like getting his email out to the whole world. Um, so there's that. Oh, yeah. So some of us on the call, I, I think Larry put in a devotion too, but there's a, a, a group called Bethany Fellows. It's a Disciples of Christ run program that's al also has an ecumenical group. And um, there's a devotional that you can get. It's called 
uh, rest and resilience. So it invites you into um, taking on some practices of rest during Lent as a form of uh, creating capacity for resilience. Um, so it's not necessarily a queer resource, but it is mostly inclusive. Um, there's uh, It's inclusive of LGBT people, but when I say mostly inclusive, I mean like using uh, no pronouns for God and that kind of thing. Some of the authors do use um, gendered pronouns for God because of their tradition. It's a, a devotional that was made from a lot of different people's perspectives and invites a lot of different contributors that were Bethany Fellows alums and uh, Bethany Fellows current folks. So um, when you read that, you get a, a vast perspective of different people who are um, uh, around the, the states too. So um, I so if you're interested in that, it's published through Chalice Press. And so you can um, uh, get that from Chalice Press. It's about $5, so not too bad. Thank you, Larry, put a link in it for it in the chat, ah, Larry. Excellent, thank you. These are great resources. Uh, thank you, so Anne, for asked, inviting us into that. Yeah, go ahead. Um, and somebody asked how to join the, the queer Zoom lectionary. Uh, so yeah, you can, I put my email, Lauren put her email, and also Colleen dropped the actual Zoom link. Um, if you want to get a calendar invite, so it automatically shows up on your calendar for each week, uh, send me an email and I'll just add you to the, the calendar invite. It's a really good, it's a good, uh, opportunity to, to connect with queer folks. And it's, uh, we actually call it the ADHD support group slash lectionary group. Uh, we're a little all over the place, and but I think sometimes we we need a place that is is safe for clergy to just kind of process through things and talk about our sermons and talk about how the world around us connects to our sermons. Luckily, when Colleen is there, like earlier today, uh, she kind of gets us back on track sometimes. <laughs> um, Bernie has a question. Yes, I'm actually really excited now about Lent this year, where I'm typically feeling apprehensive. And thanks to Ms. Ann, whom I love, and uh, I, I'll be preaching, which for me is a scary thought, um, around the first Sunday of uh, Lent, but for PSR. So if it doesn't go well, we can blame Reverend Ms. Ann. But I wanted to ask either of you or anybody in the, in the room um, I was doing some reading. I, I teach history. That's part of what I do. And I stumbled upon something called Mothering Sunday, that in the medieval period in Europe and perhaps in other places, there is this tradition of on the fourth Sunday of Lent, which is Laetare Sunday, like rejoice, right? There was this tradition in some parts of the world, mostly Europe, I'm guessing, where people would try to go back to the church of their baptism. Um, and so anyways, I was just a little bit off topic, but I want to know more about that. So I'm, I've begun to do some reading is that to do this in Lent sounds like such a really cool thing to do, especially as you come toward the end. And of course, um, you know, Easter vigil where there's baptism. So have either of you ever heard of this mothering Sunday that that's what no. fourth Sunday? Yeah. Anyways, I just thought it was kind of, kind of cool. Wanna... Oh, that's so cool. Let's Can you Google write that. something about yeah, it? Yeah, I'll, I'll put it in the chat. I was wondering if, if like, Jim Matelski, I think, who's in the room, might know something. Not yeah. to put anybody on the spot, but um, <laughs> but if there was actually, anyone, Jim would be the right one. <laughs> yeah, seriously, <laughs> of all the people okay. I know. Um, so I'll put um, this in the chat. Uh, oh, Colleen might know something too. Okay, cool. Um, uh, Colleen asks, um, "What are people doing for Ash Wednesday differently since it's Valentine's Day?" Um, one of the things that I'll lift up, which again we talked about this morning in the lectionary group, is that this. Um, the last time that Ash Wednesday fell on Valentine's Day was the day of the Parkland shooting. And um, so I think bringing some awareness of that, I mean, that we've had, of course, sadly, lots of school shootings, but it, that particular shooting kind of led to a culture shift. So I think that that also opens up kind of a, an opportunity to talk about the ways that that we're called to shift culture. Uh, and it connects to a, a, a text that we'll that we encounter in Lent, as we talked about already, with the the turning the table, turning over the tables, um, uh, 
I see that kind of protest as as very similar, and that you know the protests that came out of the the amazing young people from Parkland, the mm -hmm. survivors. Um, so, but I think ha holding on to that awareness. Um, somebody put in the chat about um, the the singleness, lifting up singleness, and, and connecting that to the the fact that people have complicated feelings about Valentine's Day, and that. So that's another thing to, to maybe touch on during um, Ash Wednesday. Um, Jim, do you want to, I saw you unmute yourself. Do you want to say more about Mothering Sunday? Um, I think Mothering Sunday is Church of England, especially. And uh, so there's a whole raft of material there, and it's in their prayer book. Um, the Letare Sunday is a rose an option to wear rose colored vestments also, which seems kind of queer to me. So when I worked at Cathedral of Hope, we had a special set of uh, vestments for just Latari that all the Queens wanted to wear because <laughs> they were beautiful. Right. And you can't only wear it that one Sunday in Advent. Exactly. You might even get a pink Charles wool if it's every year I say, why would I buy a pink Charles wool? It's only one Sunday of the year. Huh? Now it's two. But if it's two, it's, it's often two. completed with Gaudete Sunday, but they're actually different. Yeah. They're different and they're slightly different color vestments. So, oh, well, yeah. there you go. So, they just ruined my excuse for my to be a queen in this. And <laughs> I was glad to step up. Colleen, yeah. Thanks. There's also there's also a tradition on that day of feasting on Mothering Sunday. So, it's a little respite, a break in the midst of whatever Lenten fast you are having. Huh. So, you might check that out. Yeah. I just learned so much. Yeah. Me too. Thank you. So I'll add one other thing that we're doing that's different this year. I, because the way Black History Month straddles um, Lent, we put copies of the letter from the Birmingham jail in each pew, and we'll be using it as the epistle reading, not only during February, but also during uh, Lent. And uh, so, because it's an epistle, right? And when I was in seminary, some may, may, may recall this, uh, there was a movement to add the letter from Birmingham jail to the Bible, uh, to the epistles. It was unsuccessful, but um, it did actually, there wasn't a movement for this. So I think it's queering in a sense to uh, interject this, piece of Black liberation theology literature and protest literature into the literature of Lent. Uh, and uh, Martin Luther King wrote a letter on Good Friday, so. Thank you, Jim. What a great idea. That, that's a nice connection to, to uh, possibly, I haven't even mentioned this to Lauren, but maybe I'll, I'll, I'll rope you into this. Um, uh, a possible future webinar because um, many of us are working on a, a off lectionary series mm -hmm. for the summer, um, focusing on the writings of Dr. King. Um, so look for the webinar that Lauren and I apparently are going to lead on. Sweet, I'm down. Let's <laughs> Jim and Colleen too. Yeah. Uh, I love uh, Bishop Flunder always talks about or often talks about how the Bible should the the cover page on the back should be ripped off and we should add in all of these other sacred prophetic texts that uh, should fall behind it. So that might be a fun webinar to have too. Or what are the other sacred texts that we would add if we if we really just took the that back cover off? Pastor Ann might have more to say about that too, uh, being a member of City Re of Refuge too. I think you have said a good word. I know that there's some folks that are coming together actually in April with um, um, some scholars at Columbia uh, Theological um, Seminary um, to talk about um, a third uh, Third Testament. Or what would Third oh. Testament writings look like? Mm -hmm. So, which is going to be uh, quite intriguing because it allows, you know, for 
um, more stories of faith to be told, uh, more stories of faith encounters with uh, with the divine to be told because they're because in a way each one of us is a living testament. So and and there is value in who we are. So yeah, that's it. Thank you. Stay Mary. tuned. <laughs> I just want to add something real quick. This is Larry. Thank you for this time. It's been really, really good. Um, but I was thinking about this intersection with Black History Month. So using folks like James Baldwin, uh, Marsha P. Johnson, mm -hmm. and some of, you know, are preaching our, our liturgy um, as examples of Black queer people um, during, you know, during this time. So that was, um, when he mentioned uh, Martin Luther King, I was like, oh, yeah, there's other, like, Black queer folks that we could also lift up during this time, too, so... Yeah, thank you, Larry. And I take for granted in our church, we do a contemporary reading and a scripture reading to kind of like live into that idea of a third testament. Um, so if if your church isn't a community that does a practice like that or puts in some contemporary voices that like this is the perfect season and to bring in some other voices like Larry suggested is great. I love that. Thanks. Yeah, Bernie. Well, I, I just wanted to respect your time and everyone say thank you, uh, Lauren and Jacob, really wonderful. Um, and uh, did you, do you, I don't want to end it like prematurely. <laughs> Anything you want to say before we, before we conclude? Uh, I'll, I'll just say thank you. You know, I think the, the work of queering anything is a community practice. So even though Jacob mm -hmm. and I, our names were on the, you know, advertisement, this is really about all of us coming together to bring our own insights and what we see and what we are missing. So thank you for being here and let's keep in conversation throughout the season and uh, between whatever times until we have another time to gather officially. Yeah, thank you. And um, just a, a reminder, next Wednesday, we have um, Mage Mai, who coordinates our uh, AAPI roundtable, uh, doing a presentation on Dancing Lions, Queer Asian Aesthetics, Ritual and Movement Building. Same place, same time. Uh, they're as good a presenter as Lauren and Jacob are. And then for your calendar, our Latinx roundtable and CLGS is co-sponsoring uh, Professor Luis Menendez Antunia from Boston University. Uh, they have a great title. Why do biblical interpreters hate sex so much? <laughs> I love that. Um, and that'll be Thursday, April 18th. And so register for that. It's free. Um, Luis is a really great lecturer and um, biblical uh, scholar. So in any event, um, thank you. It's great to see so many folks here. Great to see familiar faces. Um, and I'll let Jacob and Lauren close this out if they want to. And thank yeah. you again, uh, both of you, for this workshop. Um, thank you. Thanks for, for having us. And thank you to everybody who attended. Um, Bernie, I don't have my list right in front of me, but I, so I don't know the exact date of the, the Trans Day of Visibility Toolkit workshop. Do you have that in front of you? Yes. Let me uh, go down here. Uh, um, so I'm doing a, a, a workshop on on helping people lift up trans day of visibility in your in your congregations and um so that's february 28 oh, sorry i don't okay. know if you can see that yeah um again but thank you um, okay. so um it's a a whole month before trans day of visibility to give you a chance to really lean into it and um there we go thank you um same time and as this workshop and so i really encourage you uh, especially if you're not a trans person to uh i mean trans folks <laughs> of course are also welcome but you know uh to come and 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 get some resources for um how to lift up the trans folks in your congregation and there's a link there and, in the chat and maybe do it on easter <laughs> <laughs> Okay, thank you everybody. Thank you, Jacob and Lauren. And uh, thanks everybody for, for being with us today.